Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's live Quest Diagnostics educational webinar on COVID-19 testing. My name is Ruth Clements, and I am the Vice President and General Manager of the Quest Diagnostics Infectious Disease and Immunology franchise, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. We are very pleased to have our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jay Wolgamuth, presenting to us today on this very important topic of COVID-19 testing. Before I hand off the presentation to Dr. Wolgamuth, I want to review a few housekeeping items for today's call. We will record this presentation and post it on the Quest Diagnostics Clinical Education Center so that you may share it with your colleagues who could not be with us today. We will also send out the link to the recording to everyone who registered their email address with WebEx as soon as possible. You are in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation and we will address your questions at the end of the presentation, but as your questions come up, please feel free to use the chat feature um, in the WebEx to submit your questions to us. Now, without further delay, I am very pleased to turn the floor over to Quest Diagnostics Chief Medical Officer and Senior Vice President, Dr. Jay Wolgamuth. All right, thank you, Ruth. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, well, thank you all for joining today. Um, Jay Wolgamuth, our Chief Medical Officer, um, broadcasting here from Southern California. And uh, um, I'm gonna go through a lot of information here uh, pretty quickly, and then there will be that opportunity to ask the chat questions or live questions to clarify. And then, as Ruth said, I believe the materials will also be recorded and available you know, um, after the webinar. Let me uh, move us here. Sorry, one second, please. So just starting off with some basics and uh, some things that we've learned in the in the recent months. And, and I, I include this early because um, in the, the February timeframe, March timeframe, there was a heavy reliance on uh, symptoms as, a, as the hook and the key. Uh, to understanding who's infected and to driving testing. And it has become incredible, you know, very clear um, that there are a range of symptoms that can occur. And in the symptomatic, those, uh, that might include also uh, respiratory symptoms, but also individuals with GI symptoms as well. Uh, but then a very large uh, impact of asymptomatic viral shedding, or in many cases, very mild symptoms that are not attributed to anything. Um, and in, in younger individuals, um, uh, often uh, totally asymptomatic cases that result in viral shedding. And this has definitely impacted, you know, how we think about testing and the role of testing in uh, dealing with uh, the crisis and in driving return to work. Uh, so we'll come back to sort of what this means uh, from a testing perspective. We do also understand that the impact of, um, from a mortality and morbidity uh, perspective is uh, much higher um, as we go up with age, a very steep age dependence on mortality, but also uh, patients with comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic conditions, and certainly individuals who have a pre-existing pulmonary condition and in, in particular, anyone who immediately um, has a uh, pneumonia uh, from this, these are groups that do not do well um, uh, when infected. The timeline, uh, most people are pretty aware of uh, the overarching timeline of our understanding in, in uh, the late 2019 that there was a, a real risk that this would become a pandemic to the February timeframe when uh, the FDA announced that independent laboratories could make uh, testing available. Uh, from that time, uh, about a week and a half later, we launched our uh, testing uh, by PCR uh, as a um, EUA, emergency use authorization from the FDA. Uh, and then we went on to uh, do a large uh, proportion of the country's testing over the next couple of months including uh, by bringing up multiple IVD platforms um, uh, across our lab locations and bringing us to where we are today in doing over 100,000 PCR tests a day um, as our current capacity. 
and in fact, uh, running that across almost 20 different laboratories um, across country. Uh, we also, uh, along the way, uh, made serology or antibody-based testing available. Um, on April 21st, uh, we also made that test available on Quest Direct, where a physician order is placed, but a consumer can um, request that testing. Uh, and then finally, um, I'll cover today, on, on the end of May, we uh, got an approval for a self-collection nasal kit uh, for PCR, and I'll show you what that is and why we think that's um, so important. So I'll start with the molecular testing, the, the PCR. Um, we offer uh, testing on multiple platforms, including our own uh, lab-developed test, uh, Roche and Hologic <coughs> platforms. We have the single national test code shown here uh, for those tests, and we've done an, a, a huge amount of work to validate uh, sample sites uh, sources shown here. Uh, with anterior nares swabs, uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, um, sputum, uh, and lower respiratory samples. We do not currently test a saliva-based sample, um, and I can talk about why that is, um, but just briefly, it's uh, not been shown to have the same level of clinical sensitivity as uh, the nasal uh, sample types. Uh, the specimen stability, we, re we accept room temperature, refrigerated, and frozen. Um, uh, and that's important because uh, different providers have uh, different uh, conditions under which they're collecting the samples. So we have a really, um, you know, broad uh, availability on the sample uh, type. And then on the, the platforms themselves, um, this is a, um, a view that helps you understand that for each one that we offer, uh, we perform, of course, uh, validation studies to demonstrate in our own hands that um, the test has adequate sensitivity and uh, specificity. And the specificity with PCR is, is pretty easy because uh, PCR is a uh, exquisitely uh, specific uh, technology and almost never produces a false positive. Um, on the sensitivity side, these assays are um, measured, you know, the, the, the bar which is given by the FDA um, is around limits of detection and a number of copies that can be detected per um, transport media volume. And in all cases, we have, you know, demonstrated adequate uh, uh, clinical sensitivity, which is better than the target um, which is set uh, by the FDA. Um, so, I, and I would also just comment that um, I don't see um, any meaningful difference uh, between the performance metrics for these different uh, platforms. Um, and so, you know, we do use them interchangeably, but at the same time, we also, um, for some larger programs, um, try to keep uh, individual customers on a single platform. The uh, uh, the test, um, as you're aware of, uh, for nucleic acid testing, um, has a specimen, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we have both the upper and lower respiratory, and I mentioned all the different, you know, uh, conditions that we can receive uh, the samples um, in, uh, from a media and transport perspective. We do publish our turnaround time for our testing um, on our website, and we can cover in the Q&A um, where to find that information. Um, and I would also say that it is important that um, a COVID test, uh, molecular test, has uh, only one specimen, uh, uh, one order, and one requisition, meaning that the test should be on an individual requisition and not have other testing included on that same rec. Uh, and, the, and similarly, should not be batched uh, together in a bag with other non-COVID uh, testing specimens. Um, and so I talked about the specimen types piece. We do have I wanted to share here um, a lot of data that's been generated in the last um, several months um, around the different sample types um, and their sensitivity and specificity. And in particular, 
There was a very large study done, uh, the Everett study, which was a collaboration between Everett, uh, UHC, the Gates Foundation, and Quest Diagnostics. Um, there were actually over 500 individuals and thousands of samples in the study. But uh, essentially what we did or what was done there is to compare uh, both self-collected and provider-collected samples uh, from these various uh, sites shown here, oral, uh, swab, nasopharyngeal sample, uh, a mid-turbinate um, self-collection or collection device and an anterior nasal a collection device and saliva. Um, and from this, uh, what we saw is that the nasal pharyngeal, the anterior nasal, and the mid-turbinate um, all had high sensitivity. Uh, we did see what has been known before, which is the saliva and the oral samples having lower clinical sensitivity. And we also, which is not shown here, uh, demonstrated that the nasal samples were the same, meaning get, gave the same performance from a sensitivity perspective, whether done by a provider or whether done by a self-collection protocol by the individual. And so based on that, we developed a self-collection kit, which I'll cover um, in a bit here. And so this is really important data to understand that the nasal samples tend to be high sensitivity sample types for uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing. Uh, we don't, we've replicated what's been seen before that the oral sample types are not as sensitive and we have validated um, that a self-collection can also be done as an alternative to a provider-based um, collection. And all of this information, we have a very detailed uh, guide available um, to uh, which kits and um, media uh, we accept, um, and that's available on our, our website uh, for download. And so um, let me then uh, show you a little more on, you know, how we've uh, developed uh, collection capabilities, and then we'll, we'll look at the self-collection kits. But as this has unfolded, as everyone's aware, um, there was a problem, uh, truly a problem, uh, with determining how can we safely get people tested. And we don't want to bring symptomatic individuals into a clinic necessarily or a hospital necessarily. Um, and yet we don't do uh, nasal collections in our patient service centers. Um, and so over time, uh, we've developed uh, lots of ways to get samples collected. The, the first is our, uh, the proverbial pop-up or drive-through um, that many of you are aware of. We do support many of these events, uh, in particular with uh, our partners of Walmart and CVS. Um, we've stood up hundreds of sites um, to allow uh, self-collection I'm sorry, collection of samples um, in that setting. We also do set up on-site events um, for either self um, uh, uh, PCR testing collections or serology-based uh, collections. And we do this often with employers, but we also do this with other customers. And then finally, we have developed really this at-home approach, which we think is very important. And you know, for obvious reasons, right, that a, um, the best approach, in my view, for an individual who is symptomatic um, is to stay at home in their room uh, and then be shipped um, a self-collection kit, which is shown here. We've developed this kit and gotten an, an emergency use authorization with, from the FDA based on the validation data that I shared with you from the Everett study and also based on additional studies we did to prove that um, the consumer could follow the protocol um, effectively. Uh, and also uh, we ironed out the logistics, which is um, a FedEx overnight shipping at room temperature, um, which is very important also because it's a very consumer uh, friendly approach. The consumer can have someone drop that box in any FedEx drop box around the country, which are you know, in all major metro areas. We also have a commitment from FedEx to put in more drop sites as needed if there are holes in the, in the network. The solution that was ultimately approved by the FDA, there were two of them, and I don't know if people see me here, but I have my props. 
This is a mid turbinate um, collection swab, and this is an anterior NARES. And what has been uh, approved here are two things. One is a self collection kit um, that allows for the individual to do this um, with an anterior NARES swab in the anterior part of the nose. Um, without observation. And so that's a fully, you know, physician ordered, but then the kit comes, individual collects, sends back at room temperature, we, we test. The other would be the um, mid-turbinate um, observed collection, and an observed collection with this kit can be done uh, with either one of these two swab types um, and would uh, need to be observed either in person by a healthcare worker um, or via telemedicine. And the, you know, of course, the, the uh, in-person uh, observation of collection is actually very interesting because it allows for more scalable uh, collection with less PPE required um, by the provider and less risk of um, exposure in the collection event itself. Um, and then, of course, all this is supported by telemedicine services so that we um, ensure that uh, whether the person has a primary physician ordering it or not, um, we have a network of telemedicine providers who can call the positives uh, and also work with us on State Department of Health reporting and then support the provider uh, who is the ordering physician so we would copy to um, the, the ordering physician. Um, in the PCR, you know, side, uh, one very important point is that we do have a prioritization process within the Quest laboratories, um, which follows the uh, P1, 2, and 3 scheme, and we literally mark samples as they're coming in based on priority, and we put the P1s at the top of the queue. And this was uh, put in place in March particularly when we were one of the, you know, largest and only, you know, one of the biggest labs uh, operating and had backlogs in our system. Uh, we put this in place and we've kept this in place so that our priority one, two, and three always uh, go through very quickly. And I think uh, even now our turnaround time on the priority ones is uh, something less than one day. Um, it was at 0.7 something recently. So we're turning the priority one, two, and three very fast, um, and we have this process in place uh, to ensure that that happens. So I'm going to turn to the uh, antibody testing now and um, share this, uh, you know, background uh, around the FDA. And I think the the, the key watch out here uh, that I will say is that. Uh, the antibody testing is not, uh, number one, to be used um, to tell someone that they are bulletproof immune. Um, and there are, there, and I'll explain to you how we see antibody testing being used that is different than that. And we also know that antibody testing should not be used alone to make the diagnosis of um, SARS of COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, because the serology, the antibody testing, will not tell you whether the person is actively secreting virus or not and is infectious or not. Um, so a couple of watch outs there. And then finally, of course, there, there were almost 200 applicants to the FDA for antibody testing, and not all tests are created equal. And so it's very important to ensure that um, when you're using a serology test that it is, in fact, an accurate and highly specific um, antibody. And so briefly, I think I'm talking mostly to uh, providers here, and so I don't need to do the basics of serology, but uh, of course, the, you know, in this disease and many others, the first signal that's detectable is often the RNA of the virus um, from a nasal swab. But then within a very short time period in this particular disease, we see the IgA and M coming up and then within seven days, you start to see IgG. By 14 days, almost everyone who's going to develop an IgG response has done so. Uh, and I say it that way very specifically because it is also true that um, maybe about 8% of people never do develop a detectable or above threshold IgG response. 
Um, so that's important to know that not everyone will, but certainly by 14 days, those people who are going to develop that detectable antibody um, have done so. So as I mentioned, um, you know, these numbers change all the time. So I've, I've made this finally greater than 170 uh, because I think it got over 200. But um, in the early days, there were many uh, tests submitted to the FDA. Many of them also were submitted as what we call EUNs, emergency use notification. And many of those did not even submit data or have a requirement for data review by the FDA. So our process was to evaluate um, all the serology tests um, out there, uh, determine which of those would be scalable in the Quest laboratories identify which of those um, had adequate data on file with the FDA to prove their um, specificity in particular, um, and then finally to do our own validation in our own laboratories to replicate that in our hands. And based on that, we ended up bringing on board uh, three different um, antibody solutions um, that we offer today. They include the Abbott, uh, Euroimmune and orthoclinical diagnostics. Um, I am very, very focused here. And by the way, I'm, I'm speaking about here IgG serology. We made a deliberate choice to just release the IgG serology at the start uh, because we felt that uh, the IgA and M could create confusion um, in the early days, but also that we wanted to focus our capacity and testing on IgG serology, which we feel is more specific and more useful in the types of programs that we're supporting. That being said, um, in all cases, we did our own uh, specificity studies and sensitivity studies. We determined very high specificity for all three of these antibodies. Um, and. Uh, I would also say, although you see some variability here in the numbers, of course, the specificity in these studies was 100%, and in, in others it was 99.4, 99.6. But you see some, some differences in sensitivity on these antibodies, and that's a little bit to be taken with a grain of salt because um, the companies that, when they did their validations, uh, Ortho Diagnostics and Abbott had different time windows in their studies. And as I mentioned, the antibodies come up in the first 14 days, and the time windows that were used in the studies are reflected in these numbers. And I would say that I don't see, from a specificity standpoint or even a sensitivity standpoint, um, a significant difference between these assays. And I would also say, although they target different antigens, the point of these tests is not to say I've identified the neutralizing antibodies in this person. The point of these tests, and I'll show you more on this, is, is um, one of the uses of the antibody test that is uh, germane is to identify individuals who have been infected um, previously with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and to do that, I need a very highly specific antibodies so that even in low prevalence areas, I'm not generating a lot of false positives. And that's what I'm using this for, is to identify that the person has been previously infected. I'm not saying that these antibodies I'm detecting are neutralizing. I'm not saying that I have to follow these to understand if they're immune. Uh, so I hope that's clear. We'll come back to that, I think, in a moment. And then I mentioned we did our own in-lab validation of each of these um, antibodies. Uh, just giving you a sense of what we do here is we test against, uh, you know, panels um, of CDC samples. We also take uh, samples out of our own archives, um, serum uh, from people tested for other respiratory um, uh, viruses, uh, and also have tested against uh, cross-reactivity for uh, other coronaviruses. One of the things I mentioned here that is very interesting is that these are very highly specific antibodies. There is one area where we do see cross-reactivity, which is with SARS-1, which is called SARS, right? So the SARS, original SARS, um, is no longer in circulation in the U.S. If it were, we would want to know about it. 
but there is some cross reactivity there, which might be expected, but is not a problem again because uh, SARS-1 is not, you know, currently a threat in in the U.S. at least. Uh, it's certainly not much worldwide going there. The test code for the serology is shown here. Uh, it's a simple blood draw. Um, we can do it. Uh, we perform the testing in 22 different laboratories across Quest. This helps us to balance load if needed uh, to make sure that everyone's getting turnaround time. Uh, and also we collect the samples in any one of our 2200 patient service centers around the country. Um, an increasing number of those are in retail sites like Safeway or Walmart. Uh, but just think of that as a Quest patient service center in a very convenient, you know, location. We also can do phlebotomy and accept samples here that come from physician offices, of course, and health systems and employer um, events. So now I'm going to talk a little bit around, so, so that was mostly around accuracy, which is point number is ensuring that you're dealing with an accurate and highly specific assay. And then point two is what is the clinical utility and what are the different uses of antibody testing? And again, I'm focusing here on IgG mostly, but we will mention IgM and A. So, you know, from an overall perspective, um, based on multiple lines of evidence, um, it is clear that an individual who is infected and recovers from uh, and develops an I, as evidenced by an IgG response, those individuals, once you've determined that they're not actively secreting the virus, are extremely unlikely to uh, pick up the virus again and bring it into the workplace, for example, anytime soon. And that person also is in a position where they very likely, uh, if they see the virus again in this season, in this year, um, will have a secondary immune response and not a primary immune response. It will not be the first time that they've seen this. At the same time, it is also clear after 9 million infections around the, the, the world, there has been uh, no validated case showing a reinfection after recovery from a primary infection with SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, what that means is, and there certainly are indolent cases and cases that uh, go into the ICU and can test positive and negative and positive again. Uh, and those cases so far have all been shown to be with the same primary virus that the person was infected with. So all this is to say that, um, and I'm going to show you how, how we're, we're using serology testing or our customers are in programs. Um, but the point is that uh, there certainly is uh, some value in knowing for an individual um, whether there has been a prior infection with SARS-CoV-2. And that is the primary use where you'll see this, uh, you know, having value in, in programs. And I'll show you what that looks like. We do, based on all the evidence so far, believe that SARS-CoV-2 fits into this sort of paradigm here um, with uh, SARS-1 and MERS um, with a uh, short-term immunity, meaning not decades long or lifelong, uh, but uh, certainly for this particular virus, the prior infection uh, would put you in a situation of being um, ha having some immunity uh, for over a year, as was the case with SARS-1. Again, even if the person sees that virus again, it is possible that an individual can be reinfected. However, uh, it, the, that person is having a secondary immune response, meaning they're seeing the virus for the second time. And in almost all cases in prior uh, scourges of this nature, what you'll see is that those individuals very, very rarely have um, a serious uh, clinical infection. Let me just move us forward. So there are, uh, there are guidelines um, uh, that uh, exist on the SARS-CoV-2. I want to point out a couple important things. The first is that there is a recommendation out to say 
uh, serology and PCR or molecular testing should be entertained if you're dealing with a person who is presenting 9 to 14 days after exposure or here it says illness onset. And so that's a specific recommendation that the CDC uh, came out with and it, it basically recognizes that individuals in that time frame can test negative by PCR yet still be infected and that using serology and molecular together might make sense in that time window. Aside from that, most of the rest of these have to do with IgG serology exclusively and the use to detect um, antibodies, but uh, specifically to identify individuals who have been infected previously and have mounted an immune response. Importantly here, you gotta you know, recognize that I could detect an antibody in a person, that person can still be shedding virus. And so once I've identified an individual that has mounted an IgG response with a specific antibody, if I'm gonna return them to work, let's say, I still need to do a PCR to determine that they're not actively shedding virus and on the tail end of an infection. Now, the, the science around that is uncertain because it is possible, and it's been shown before, that people late in a infection with IgG antibodies present, may that, that virus may not be infectious. It may be viral fragments and particles. And actually, I've seen in my own practice here um, lots of cases actually of prolonged uh, detectability uh, by PCR uh, in an individual's nose after an infection. And so just, you know, to be uh, with an abundance of caution though, if you have an IgG positive, that person may still have detectable viral shedding and is, is possibly still infectious. So one would need to, you know, evaluate that as well. The FDA and others have also put into this bucket that individuals who have been shown to be previously infected through antibody testing might be able to also donate uh, their plasma uh, for therapeutic purposes. The FDA's uh, guidance on this is, it was summarized there, but it's essentially saying um, healthcare professionals uh, can use this to identify people who may have been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 and may have recovered. Uh, and so again, it's not to establish whether they have immunity, it's to say, have you been infected or not? Uh, and then again, advising here to avoid the use of, um, of serology as a diagnostic, that the diagnosis and the determination of viral shedding needs to be done um, using PCR. Um, we've done a set of uh, studies and, and have a lot of ongoing collaborative work that we're doing or that we're tracking through others um, that is meant to get at key scientific questions that are shown here. Uh, a lot of seroprevalence studies going on out there in collaboration with the CDC. We're using um, our discards in many cases to help uh, fill out um, together with sharing our own data and uh, uh, providing testing for CDC to generate seroprevalence data. And seroprevalence data is really important as you begin to say, um, how should I construct a program to return to work, let's say, in any given region? And um, I'll, I'll point out why that's so important. Um, also, uh, a lot of studies coming soon about the dynamics between serology and PCR and the timing. And of course, um, a lot of work also going on to link um, recovery from infection and um, IgG serology to protective immunity in a you know, more of a linear way to say that there is a capability to make a, a specific call on level of immunity based on serology results. And that is coming and I, I can take questions and talk about how we're gonna get there. And then finally, a lot of work on what is the best protocol to really help a hospital or an employer, you know, get people back to work, and that's an integrated program with multiple pieces, and implement, implementation science is ongoing and needed to figure out what really works here, what's the right approach.
And so with that, I'm going to finish with a just a quick discussion of how this comes together in return to work, return to life programs, as we like to say. And, you know, at first we were you know, focused on return to work, but it's turned out that this is, you know, kind of a need for everyone, you know, to figure out how do we return to school, how do governments reopen, how do we reopen a healthcare system or physician office. So everyone needs a strategy here. Um, and so, I'll, you know, there, there are some components that are shared with all of these um, settings. We have um, put together um, a set of solutions to help. Uh, let's just focus on large employers for a moment. Uh, but again, the same approach can be used in other settings. And it's, it's testing for sure. There's a big role of PCR and there is a role of uh, antibody testing here, but it's also uh, um, engaging a population with um, applications, uh, enabling a consent having a questionnaire on a daily basis that an, or on any basis that a employee can fill out around symptoms and exposures and get directed with decision support on what they need to do and if they need testing. We include the testing components that we'll talk about, but also there are on-site components which are either testing events or temperature monitoring services that are uh, uh, helpful in reminding people uh, to not come to work sick. And then on the back end, there's uh, the analytics that need to go to the employer. There's the results and the care that needs to uh, come to the employee. Um, and there's also telemedicine services that are a component of making this um, fly. And so the, you know, from a uh, program perspective, one of the common things we see is absolutely uh, being sure that there is a protocol for symptomatic testing uh, to ensure that anyone in a workplace environment is, has access to PCR if needed based on symptoms. And that's enabled significantly by self-collection kits as well. Uh, serology has a role here, which I'll show you. Um, and data integration and applications are critical. Uh, the employees um, uh, in a program um, have a digital experience that I've mentioned that allow them to have a questionnaire, interact with their results, and get decision support on what is needed. And these are my summary points on these programs, and, and I've really distilled it down to what I think is the, you know, the, the top recommendations we have um, to folks in this area. One is, uh, and specifically on the use of serology, which is a, which is a big question. Number one, um, only use highly accurate and specific assays. As soon as you start to compromise on specificity, as you test in low prevalence areas in particular, false positive rates will be a problem. With highly specific assays, we do still guide though that if you're in a very low prevalence area, uh, we'll provide that prevalence data and help people understand, you know, what would a um, what would be a prevalence rate for serology positivity that where it would make sense to include uh, antibodies in a program. And importantly, no employer that I've seen is using serology to say a person can or cannot return to work. Uh, a person with a positive serology still would need to be ruled out for secreting the virus, as I mentioned. They should still also follow the social distancing guidelines in the workplace. Um, and, uh, but the information does provide value uh, for individuals, such as if I'm running a, um, a program and I need, uh, let's say I'm running a nursing home and I have my worker coming in to take care of my, my, um, my uh, elderly patients in that nursing home, if I have surveillance going on, those that are IgG positive and have been ruled out for virus don't necessarily need surveillance, don't necessarily need symptomatic PCR testing for this virus. And so that's a benefit to the overarching program. You also see individuals who have preexisting conditions, uh, pulmonary disease, uh, elderly at home, who really do want to understand this information prior to returning to work and might even modify their work habits or position in order to, you know, ensure that they're safe 
if they've not been previously exposed. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, uh, even if, uh, if IgG serology is used, um, a PCR is still needed to rule out active viral shedding. Um, and, uh, and, and the surveillance is different, perhaps, in people who are IgG positive not needing ongoing surveillance. And so you can kind of see here how it breaks out that it's not, again, that uh, only positives return to work. It's that the information might be valuable to the individuals and as part of an overall screening program or testing program, uh, IgG positive may not need that same level of, uh, of surveillance and that actually makes a big difference if you're dealing with, you know, thousands of people in large return to work programs. And here's how it kind of comes together. You sort of always see PCR being used for symptomatic and high-risk exposures, but then you think about a nursing home or a hospital where, well, maybe I need uh, PCR uh, mandatory for the first return to work and periodic surveillance in, the, in my workers due to the nature of their job. And then at the same time, serology recommendations may vary depending on the prevalence of antibody in um, the location. And then finally, it is important to realize there's the on-site components of return to work that um, are often uh, implemented. And here I'll, you know, you'll leave you with this one, but this is kind of a more complicated, uh, you know, uh, uh, scheme that says, okay, well, if I do have data on PCR and I do have a serology information available, how are these groups treated in my return to work program? And what I'm showing here is really just a distillation of what we're seeing with large employers who are implementing um, these sorts of programs. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it, you know, um, in the package here for, for people to, uh, to uh, benefit from. And then, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we've been doing a lot of work with, uh, with universities, with employers, with hospitals. Part of this is we've been doing it on ourselves um, and others in the last three months, right? Keeping um, our phlebotomists out in the field, keeping our labs operating, working with ventilator manufacturers and meat packers and trying to keep things going. And now, of course, we have a much broader reopening going on, for better or for worse, um, by region. Uh, and you can see, you know, there, there's just a huge amount of variability in what a return to work program looks like based on your region in the country, based on the job categories within your business, based on uh, the state regulations and laws that are ongoing, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have lots of examples of uh, different strategies, and we tend to advise, uh, you know, on what would make sense and then try to, you know, um, uh, accommodate the, the wide variability there are in circumstances, infection rates, geographies, and job categories. So with that, um, that was a lot of information. I think this is the end of our presentation. Oh, last point, and then we'll go to the questions. Um, there's a silver lining in all this. Uh, now, part of it was not so great, which is during this uh, period of time, people absolutely were not, you know, getting the health care that they needed for everything else. And you see, of course, um, diabetic uh, testing rates, you know, went way down for a period of time. Uh, cancer diagnosis went down, but I doubt the, you know, rate of cancer went down <laughs> during this period. And I think what has happened is we've realized, um, you know, we've accelerated a trend that is important, which is uh, designing healthcare around individuals and consumers. And now us as consumers and us as doctors are also saying, wow, we've got to not just during the pandemic, but maybe, you know, on an ongoing basis, put more energy into telemedicine, into home-based care, and, uh, you know, getting people healthcare delivery around their needs and locations. And so, uh, you know, from both a uh, SARS-CoV-2 and a more general standpoint, you know, we've been investing heavily in ensuring everything is enabled by telemedicine, ensuring we have home kits uh, for COVID, but also can we, can we do home-based testing for diabetes, uh, hemoglobin A1C? Yes, we can. Um, and urine microalbumin. 
and uh, some of those services that are really needed by people on a regular basis but are massively disrupted when they can't go into the office or, you know, in this, in this time of crisis. Um, so I've mentioned that, and I think it's really, really important that uh, I, some of this is not just a temporary. Uh, some of this is, I think, a new normal that we need to be working toward in providing more consumer-centered um, care. So I think I've made it through, and I'm going to invite Ruth to come back on the line with me and, and help uh, answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolgamuth. Um, we do have a few minutes to address some questions, and I'm going to dive straight into the list of uh, questions that we received through the chat. And for those of you, if you do have questions and have not submitted it yet, please go to the chat uh, window to submit your question. So the first um, question, um, I have a client who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies through Quest. His wife tested negative for antibodies through Quest. He had mild symptoms. She had none. Can you explain this? Um, I think my, the, one of the things I would need to know is were they both confirmed to have had uh, PCR positive results? If they both um, were confirmed to have PCR uh, positive results, then in the one that tested negative by antibody, there's a couple possibilities. One, she or he was a one of the 8% who do not mount a uh, effective uh, IgG response or don't cross the threshold. So there's about 8% in that group. And the second would be timing. You'd have to determine was the testing done clearly 14 days after an exposure or initial symptoms. And those would be two reasons, you know, that, that and you do see people who have PCR positivity who test negative on a antibody result, yeah. at least 8%. Thank you. Um, the next question is around the patient self swab kits and, and their availability. When um, will this be available, um, the interior and nearest kits uh, that could be um, used for self-collection or those kits that could be supervised through telehealth? Right. Uh, both are available now. So we, you have the two options, the telehealth-enabled observed self-collection or in-person observed self-collection and then the fully unobserved self-collection that gets shipped to a person's home. On the unobserved self-collection, where we it is available now, but we're um, we're ramping up our capacity levels, and we're beginning now to uh, make some of that available um, to both employers, but also health systems and physician offices. And so, if there's a strong interest on you know this uh, on your side, whoever's asking the question, then uh, you know reach out to a Quest representative, and and we'll figure out whether either the observed self-collection or the unobserved self-collection can be used in your practice. And so they're both available. It's just on the, self, the unobserved self-collection, we're ramping up capacity and we have a limitation that it has to be run on our LDT for now, which is a good chunk of volume, but is not all of our capacity to 100,000 a day. So both available, please inquire with your Quest representative to see if it's you know, available in your setting. Thank you. Um, there are some questions also around um, turnaround time. What is your turnaround time supposed to be? Currently, it seems to be four to five days. Other sources, sources are able to turn around in two days. Why the discrepancy? And, and I will actually answer that um, myself. Um, our current turnaround times, as they were reported literally about five minutes ago, um, for the molecular test, um, our, the average turnaround time is 2.7 days. Um, for the P1, um, NP2, NP3 um, allocations, as uh, Dr. Wolkham um, presented, for P1, our turnaround time, time is 0 .9, uh, sorry, 0 0.68 days at the moment. For P2, it's 0 0.98 days, and for P3, it's 1.53 days. Um, you know, we um, have ramped up our capacity um, of testing. We are currently at around 100,000 tests per day. We are ramping it up um, to get to 
150,000 molecular tests per day and beyond um, in collaboration with our industry partners. Um, but what we're also seeing is a continuing increased demand for molecular testing nationwide um, and a larger interest in, in customers sending test requests. So the near-term demand that we're seeing for plus services could outstrip the capacity that we currently have available. So as a result, uh, we are projecting that the average turnaround time for molecular tests across our network may be in the excess of three days over the next um, three to four weeks. And that's it's purely, as I mentioned, a function of the increase of demand that we're seeing now that states and um, you know, the country is opening back up. I'm going to move to the next question for um, Dr. Wolgamuth. Which test is being recommended for return to work? Antigen or antibody? Ah, good question. Uh, the, I mean, primary is uh, sort of obvious that um, the PCR testing is a critical tool to have available for any return to work program, at least for symptomatic, you know, and uh, high risk individuals. And that can be defined by lots of things. Uh, where they live, what their job function has been, what they've been doing the last, you know, month. Um, and a lot of companies uh, and, and groups are using PCR in a broader way to say, I want to ensure that when the students come back to the campus, uh, the dorm, or when the hospital reopens, that the providers are not shedding virus because there's so much asymptomatic viral shedding. So PCR has a very clear role there. And then, as I showed in sort of that last page, and you can look there, if, you know, those employers that are also implementing the antibody testing, um, there's value in that as well. And it actually interplays with reducing the need for surveillance and PCR testing in a group. And actually, one of the things we will probably get to at some point in some places, like, let's say, northern New Jersey, would be that, you know, if I now have a workplace and I've vetted and I have 50%, 40% uh, of my people are IgG positive, uh, you definitely get some shielding in a workplace and some herd immunity in that workplace. Um, so anyway, both are used, and um, I've shown you in this presentation different ways that uh, those two tests can be used and returned to work. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, the viral shedding you report from day 7 to 12, is this only infectious RNA or probably just fragments? Well, there you go. That's the, that's the gazillion dollar question. I, I do think uh, there are studies that we're doing and others right now to literally take samples from those individuals and test them for live virus with uh, live viral studies. So that's going on right now, and I think most believe, certainly after 14 days, that most are not infectious. But it's a very tough call, right? So I, I think uh, that's, you know, if you look at the CDC guidelines, you'll see that there's kind of a testing-based protocol to say someone's negative and so I can have them come back. But there's also a time-based protocol for exactly this reason that you can detect viral fragments in people for a long time in some. And it's very clear in many of them that that's not infectious, so that that's why this time-based protocol from the CDC comes in to say, I might not get a, a negative PCR, but after 14 days, I can't remember exactly what it is, but uh, you're right, there's a time-based protocol to say, now I can release this person from quarantine based on time and not based on testing. So I can't really tell you. I think my, you know, scientist in me says that after, you know, a good IgG response and after 14 days, they're almost certainly not infectious, but we still recommend testing to rule it out if you're going to bring someone back before their time period is up. Uh, thank you. Um, another question around uh, antibody testing. Um, what percentage will not get an IgG response? And there's also a lot of... Um, noise out there um, about immunity and, and, and how to really interpret serology uh, testing. And, and there's even been a recent study um, that said that immunity can disappear in a short period of time. Um, so how would you utilize um, the serology tests that are out there? Is it just 
for research? Is it, what is, how should we interpret yeah. those results? Yeah, I think that, that that's a great kind of closer here, actually, because I, I feel strongly about this. The, the, the way that I'm recommending, the way I'm showing this use of serology for IgG is to say, I need to identify people who have been previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 and have recovered. And uh, I would, again, I do PCR in them to make sure they're not shedding virus actively. But once I've determined that, you know, that recent study that came out, what it showed is something we already know, that the antibody levels themselves drop over the months. That's true. But that person is still going to have a secondary immune response when they see the virus again. And this is why there have been zero reported cases or documented cases of reinfection with a second instance after recovery from SARS-CoV-2 worldwide, right? So, so I think it's really important that it's not about that level of the antibody. It's about knowing that a person has been previously infected and has recovered. Now that individual is it doesn't matter what their antibody level is. That individual is significantly protected as compared by to an individual who has not been previously infected. So that's really the big difference. So even in that recent study that came out, as the antibody levels drop, those people still are going to have a secondary immune response, right? And, and so it's not about following those levels. It's about identifying people who have been previously infected and then uh, that's information that they want to know, perhaps, to protect themselves and their family. But it's also information that helps you construct the safe workplace to say, okay, I now know that this person is extremely unlikely to bring that virus into the workplace, right? And on an immunity standpoint, just remember, it's not about that one antibody we measure. It's about the fact that the person has seen and recovered from the infection and that puts them into a, a very different category from a risk perspective. So that's the, that's the big question, a lot there. Um, hopefully the information here is, is helpful and shows you some places where uh, the antibody testing can be useful and can be interpreted you know, in a useful way. But uh, I think we're at the end. We're up on time. Yes. If I'm right, yeah. Ruth. Um, yeah, you are correct. We are unfortunately already out of time today. So I want to thank all of you for attending today's presentation on COVID-19 testing. And I especially want to thank you, Dr. Wolgenwood, for being here because I know that you are incredibly um, busy. No busier than any of the rest of us, right? But uh, <laughs> thank you all for participating and thank you, Ruth, for uh, everything you've done so far here. And we'll keep, yeah. keep working on this. And um, thanks again for all the good questions and engagement. Uh, in the audience.